You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is Episode 109, covering the week of February 19th through February 23rd, 2018. Glad to have you back on the program. Glad to be here. We had a great week at the Institute, but before we get started with that, just want to remind you that you can follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. You can like our Facebook page at Ab- page, excuse me, at Abbeville Institute, and you can subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Inst, where we post uh, the podcasts as well as our videos from our conferences. Also want to remind you that if you go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org, and give us an email address, we will give you a free ebook, Kirkpatrick Sales Emancipation Hell, and that will put you on our email list, and you'll get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday, along with our weekly emails Saturday or Sunday. And, of course, we exist on your generous contributions alone, so if you would like to help the Abbeville Institute explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, you can go to abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll see a button that says Memberships, you click on that, and you'll find all kinds of different options to give to the Institute, or actually says support, and under that you'll find memberships. And uh, you can give as little as $3 a month or $5 a month, $3 a month if you're a student, $5 a month if you're not a student, or you can give an annual donation, $25 a year if you're a student, or $50 a year if you're not. And, of course, there's higher options as well. We appreciate any contribution. It will help not only keep the podcast going, but also our website, our conferences, all the things that we do to try to provide educational opportunities for the people of the South and even outside of the South. You know, we have people following our work all over the world. So it's an opportunity to spread the message of what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Now, there's also a couple of new ways to engage the Abbeville Institute. We have an Abbeville Institute app. So if you go to your application store on your uh, mobile device, whether it's an Apple device or a non-Apple device, you go to where you get your mobile uh, mobile applications, Google Play, or your um, your iTunes store. Just search for Abbeville Institute, and you will find our application there. You can get all of our lectures on the go from all of our uh, previous summer schools and scholar com- scholars conferences that we have available. Also, this podcast is on that application as well, so you can listen to us in your car. And it also uh, has information on getting our RSS feed. So if you want to uh, just use it to look at the articles every day that we put on the website, Monday through Friday, you can do that as well. And you can also get your Abbeville Institute gear now as well. We have embroidered shirts, hats, and uh, fleece, as well as golf towels. So if you would like to get that material, you can go to our website. And at the top of the page where it says support, you'll see a little, when you drop down that menu, it says shop. You click on that, take you right out there to get our merchandise. So go on out and get some Abbeville Institute gear, wear our shirts, wear a hat, proudly support the Institute, and, of course, get the application as well. A couple of new things that we got just this week to help uh, market the Institute and help stay in contact with you. All right, so all that said, uh, let's get to the material for the week. We spent uh, about three minutes there talking about things that we need to do and try to reach more people with the Institute, and that is we're always trying to reach more people. Um, So uh, let's talk about our material for the week, though, which is really our bread and butter. And all of the material for this week actually has to do with a changing perspective on Southern history. And what do I mean by that? Well, I remember a colleague of mine uh, who who was an affiliated scholar of the Institute, but uh, I won't name him, but he is an affiliated scholar. And I remember there was a Liberty Fund conference one time uh, with this particular scholar, and something was brought up about you know why the the uh, the real federalism of the founding generation die, and his comment was, well, because we lost the war, and it wasn't just real federalism that was killed as a result of losing the war in 1865. The other thing that happened was that the entire structure of American history was going to be changed, and this is where Susan Mary Grant wrote a very good book entitled North Over South. But the entire perspective of America changed with that loss. Because until that point, as we've talked about on this podcast, as we've talked about in lectures, the vision of America that Americans had, America was dominated by the South, the Southern vision, what we call oftentimes a Jeffersonian vision. 
But that agrarian Jeffersonian vision dominated America. It dominated the Western movement. Uh, it dominated the way that Americans thought about political economy. It dominated the way Americans thought about government, North and South. The most important Americans, North and South, were generally Southerners. George Washington was a Southerner. Thomas Jefferson was a Southerner. Daniel Boone was a Southerner. Davy Crockett was a Southerner. Andrew Jackson was a Southerner. John Marshall was a Southerner. I mean, you look at the people that really dominated American history up until 1861, and most of them were Southerners. Presidents, Supreme Court justices, congressmen. Henry Clay was a Southerner. Uh, so we may not agree with all of these Southerners, but the South still dominated America. And when you get to 1861 and you have the war and then the, the aftermath of the war, 1865, what you find is that these people that were always Southerners became honorary Yankees, as Clyde Wilson likes to say. George Washington became an honorary Yankee. Henry Clay became an honorary Yankee. John Marshall became an honorary Yankee. These people all of a sudden became Northerners. Uh, these nationalists, and Southern nationalism and Northern nationalism were quite different things, in fact. Even John C. Calhoun was a nationalist for a time. I mean, and his, he, I think that he would always say that he was a nationalist in that he believed in the Union, the Union of the Founders. As he said, the Union, next to our liberty most dear, liberty was first and foremost in the minds of the founding generation. The Union came second, and that that began to change as the Union became a means to an end for the North and their sectional conquest of the United States. And so it wasn't just political economy that resulted in this, in this sectional conquest of the United States. It was also the way we thought about our history and the way we thought about our, the, the people that dominated American government, the way we thought about American government in general. And now it's the way we think about culture in America. It's always been a northern culture. I mean, the entire idea of, say, the Straussians is that Jefferson's throwaway lines in the Declaration of Independence, which he said himself, were just a simple expression of the American mind. They really didn't mean much. That all men are created equal. That those lines somehow became the most important part. Why? Because that's what Northerners started to say about the Declaration. So the Straussian version, they, they've yankified Thomas Jefferson. When in reality, the most important part of the Declaration was not that. It was the last paragraph, which talked about free and independent states and establishing this idea of a federal republic, which had existed before the Declaration because we had states, contrary to what James Wilson of Pennsylvania said and argued consistently. That vision of America was never the dominant vision. That vision of America did not dominate until the war was over, and we started thinking about things differently. So people in the North loved the South. I mean, Edgar Allan Poe was considered to be an important writer, even though he would wage war against the northern literati uh, at, the, at the time. He, they, they sometimes looked down their nose at the South. But you had some pretty important southern writers in the period leading up to the war, William Gilmore Sims, Henry Timrod, uh, but uh, Sims foremost among them. And, of course, Sims was blacklisted once uh, this uh, 1850s period kicked up all of the strife between North and South because he wrote what were called anti-Uncle Tom's Cabin novels. And so um, that changed some things. But what happened after the war is that Plymouth became more important than Jamestown. George Washington was really just a northerner just from Virginia. I mean, that's really what he was. Uh, the Hamiltonian vision of everything in America became more important. And, of course, Lincoln, even though Lincoln was really from the he's from Kentucky, and this is why Lincoln was actually chosen by the Republican Party, because he thought maybe he'd get some Southern support. Uh, you know, he's from Illinois, but uh, born in Kentucky, even Lincoln became, you know, an honorary Yankee. So this Yankee vision, this Northern vision of America wins out. And so all the pieces that we had this week, in, in some way, focus on that particular theme. So if we start with our piece on Monday, it's in, by Philip Lee, and it's entitled True Grit as a Reconstruction Story. Now, it was often thought, you know, True Grit was a novel about Reconstruction in Arkansas and the Indian Territory, as uh, Philip Lee points out. And, of course, um, the main character is a former Confederate soldier. And 
everyone that read this novel understood that. And so when you watch the movie, which, of course, the, the first version stars John Wayne, and then it was remade later, you don't get that from the remake. You get it more from the, from the John Wayne version. But the novel is just saturated with uh, this reconstruction, this Southern reconstruction story. But it's a very pro-South Southern reconstruction story. Um, and so uh, Philip Lee actually points out there's some quotes in this particular book that don't make into the movies. But here's one, quote, Papa used to say that the only friends we had down here right after the Civil War were the Irish Democrats in New York. Thad Stevens and the Republican gang would have starved us all out if they could. That's from the book. And then he says, since Maddie's story is a reminisce, reminiscence by an old lady during the 1920s, it is significant that she remarks, quote, I am not afraid of Al Smith for a minute. He's a good Democrat. When he's elected, I believe he will do the right thing. He says, of course, she was referring to New York Governor Al Smith, who was an Irish-American Catholic that ran for president in 1928. Maddie is saying that she did not hold his religion against him. While historians often castigate 1920s-era Southerners for racial prejudice, they seldom note that six of the eight states that voted for the first Roman Catholic presidential candidate were Southern, including Arkansas. And so this is an interesting story because it, it kind of blows apart this very Northern narrative of what the South was after the war. But it also shows sharecropping in the South, the impoverishment of the South, uh, which, as we pointed out in this podcast, was quite extensive. In fact, the South became the colonial property of the North in so many ways. And so this is an important part of this Reconstruction story. And then you look at the piece that we ran on uh, Wednesday, and I'll get back to the Tuesday piece in a minute. The piece we ran on Wednesday, which is entitled Judas and Jeff, and this is by Paul Yarbrough. And this explains very nicely a real problem with Southerners. And this is what Donnie Kennedy was talking about last week when he pointed out that uh, the South sucker suffers from a Stockholm Syndrome. Jeff Sessions is part of that Stockholm Syndrome. And Jeff Sessions from Alabama, you should know better than some of the things he's said and some of the things he's done. But, of course, this being from a comment he made that the issue was all about, the, the war was all about slavery. That was it. And so Yarborough points out that Jeff Sessions has become Judas to his own people. He sold out for the accolades, for the wealth, as Judas did, for the wealth of the Republican Party. Because the Republican Party has never really been a friend of the South. The Republican Party has always been the enemy of the South. It's just that Southerners had nowhere else to go in their own mind because the Democrats had moved so far left that they had to go somewhere. And, of course, the Republicans were seen as, well, I mean, this is it. Uh, we can't third-party it because we'll just keep getting these uh, very left-wing presidents or left-wing politicians. So we got to go with something. So they went with the Republican Party, and they bought into Richard Nixon's Southern strategy and... Um, there, therein lies the problem. Southerners are consistently relied upon by Republicans to vote their way, yet they don't always support the South. And they'll say things like, well, the war was all about slavery. Um, and so, as Yarborough, point, Yarborough points out, this is, this is not discussing the complexity. Of course, we also have Jeff Sessions as part of this recent... Uh, debate on you know, gun control and other things, and of course, uh, immigration. And so there are things that you know, Southerners tend to support politically or uh, when it comes to issues that they don't necessarily support the positions that Jeff Sessions is taking right now. And this is why the Republican Party is so problematic. It's funny, somebody remarked that uh, the Abbeville Institute only gets our news from, only gets our information from Fox News, and we're just pro-Trump. We have uh, we've been quite critical of Fox News and the Republican Party, and this review was actually left actually left um, right about the time this piece was put up on Facebook. And so here we have a piece that blows apart what he just said. But yet this is what they say. And this is because people can't get out of their own way, and, they, and when they think about things, everything is national. And this is where uh, you know Sessions is a national Republican. He's he's not necessarily someone who is uh, an Alabamian. He's a national Republican. He's bought in to the national Republican agenda. And that's unfortunate because that national Republican agenda has never been 
for the South or for the Southern tradition. The Republican Party, as I've argued in my own podcast, hasn't really ever changed. And some people say, well, sure it has. It's changed. How can you say that? How can you say it hasn't changed? It hasn't changed. It's advocated essentially the same positions from the time it was in, in, of its inception in the 1850s until today. It really hasn't changed. Maybe rhetorically at times it says some things, there, but if you look at the way it governs, it's always been a centralizing national party. It doesn't really believe in federalism. It doesn't really believe in the original Constitution. It doesn't. It never has. It's never really been a quote-unquote American conservative party. So Southerners don't really have a choice when it comes to the Southern tradition in any party. It's, it's very difficult. And there's been times that people have recognized this, of course, and, and uh, been very hostile to both parties in the South. And um, you know, so this is, you know, the Institute is apolitical. We, we, we support the Southern tradition, and we will call out both parties that don't support the Southern tradition and, and uh, give both parties credit if they do. But Sessions is indicative of this changing narrative of what the South is. The National Republicans have never been in favor of a version of American history that is pro-Southern. They've always been interested in a Lincolnian vision of America. That Lincolnian vision of America is at odds with the uh, Jeffersonian vision of America and what America is and what America was. It's always been at odds with that. And so that vision, when I say that vision, it's not ideology. It's rooted in something real, which is a people in a place. That's where federalism comes from. It's the wellspring of federalism, a people in a place. It's not some type of idea, well, we have to support federalism, but it's because federalism supports the people in the place of those states and those regions, north and south, not just in the south. It also supports, or west. I mean, California could have its own people in place whereas so could Alabama, and so could Vermont, so could North Dakota. It's anti-imperialist is really what it is, more than anything else, this idea of federalism. And it's pro-union because it doesn't force one culture or the, the, the ideas of one people down the throats of another. And that said, I'm going to skip over Thursday for a second. When you talk about that sort of imperialism, the piece we ran on on. Um, Friday was entitled A City Upon a Hill by uh, Dissident Mama. And this is a nice little summary of Puritanism. And I know that there are a lot of people, uh, at least northern Puritanism, because um, there are people that get very defensive when you start you listen to this podcast, or people affiliated with the Institute, like the Institute, if we start talking about Puritanism, because they think we're taking aim at the Congregationalist churches that are so popular in the South today, whether it's uh, the Baptist Church, or the Methodist Church, or whatever the case may be. It's not necessarily attacking those churches. It's attacking Puritan imperialism, Yankee imperialism, imperialism, which was in so many ways formed by the ideas, and I think Dissident Mama does a nice job here, formed by the ideas of Puritanism at the time, which was a city upon a hill. You're going to be like us, or we're going to force you to be like us. And so that becomes the basis of things like social justice, puritanical progressives, as she says. That's what she calls them. But this is where it comes from, this very strong trend of the Puritans, as David Hackett Fisher does a very good job of explaining in his Albion Seed, and what they were about at the time and how they viewed things and what they did. This is, this is the issue, and this is why the Yankees won the intellectual war, because um, there's a great line in the movie Ride with the Devil, and we've, we've talked about it on this podcast before, where when Northerners went into an area, they built a school first. Not a church. They built a school first because they realized if they could control the minds of the youngsters, they could control the future. It's very Orwellian. But this puritanical zeal, which in some ways is interesting because the Puritans themselves, even in their own communities, were very closed off to outsiders, but they wanted to ensure that others would be like them. This is, I mean, if you weren't, they would browbeat you. This, this term browbeating actually came from Connecticut, which is interesting. But they would do it until you, you were like them. They would just wear you down. Or 
Eventually, by the 1840s and 50s and then 60s, they would kill you if you weren't like them. You didn't, you didn't identify with them. So when you look at, um, and as she says, the, the pilgrims weren't looking for religious tolerance. They were looking for freedom from other religions, from other religions. You know, it's, it's the, they were against the Baptists and the Quakers and, and the Anglicans, the, the Orthodox Anglicans, and of course the Catholics. In fact, uh, you know, these people, particularly Baptists and Quakers, Quakers will be hung in Puritan Massachusetts. They were not tolerant people. At all. And you find that in this modern progressive left, they are the intolerant people. That is the puritanical zeal of those intolerant people, and this comes from the North. Whereas, you look at Charleston, it was the holy city, because you had large numbers of different denominations in Charleston itself. A large contingency of Jewish people in the South, for example, Catholics in Maryland. Of course, Orthodox Anglicans, but... Uh, others as well. Uh, so French Huguenots and, and uh, Baptists eventually and Presbyterians and uh, Methodists. And of course, as the Great Awakening spread these things to the South, you, you started seeing the, the introduction of the Congregationalist Church. But certainly the South, as we just talked about with True Grit, was in many ways much more tolerant than people realized when it came to religious diversity. And, and uh, I'll point out, I used a story from an area where, where I live, there was a, a this area had no Catholic church at one point, and then back in the 1920s, a Catholic church was installed in this area, and, and there was some little bit of angst about that until, actually it was the 19-teens, into the uh, early 1900s, I should say, until they had the Spanish flu outbreak of the, of the uh, 1919, and these nuns took care of so many sick people in this town that they accepted and embraced the Catholic church, even though they didn't convert to Catholicism, but they embraced the nuns because they saw these people as good Christian people. But again, we don't have this vision because we have a northern-dominated version of American history. We don't think the South is that way, and we, we, we don't think anything like that because the North dominates. And so that is North over South. It changes literature. It changes history. It changes politics. It even changes, as I mentioned before, Washington. Washington became an honorary Yankee, and so the piece on Thursday was entitled Washington and Lee, Southerners. And it's our lecture from our 2016 summer school by Bill Wilson, who's one of our affiliated scholars, of course, always at the summer school's great uh, lecturer, um, someone who does a very fine job with religion and literature in the South and just delivers great lectures, and of course those things are available on our on our website and also our, our app. Go out and get our app and our YouTube page. So go out and listen to his lectures. But I will say this, and it's something that uh, actually uh, Dr. Livingston, it's a poem by Melville. I don't, I'm not going to, I'm going to paraphrase it, but essentially Melville said that if you're looking at Washington, if you're looking at Washington, you're looking at Lee, or you're looking at Lee, you're seeing Washington is the way he said it. You're looking at Lee, you're seeing Washington. You have to turn away. You have to get rid of that thought because the two are the same. But, of course, Northerners don't want you to understand that. They want you to look at Lee as something different than Washington. And even now, there was a book that just came out, you know, The Man Who Would Not Be Washington, about Lee. And uh, you have uh, a Pryor's book about Lee saying Lee never really cared about Washington. It wasn't important. He didn't like Washington. It didn't matter. Lee didn't think about Washington at all. They were two different people. They're just two different things. You can't put Washington and Lee together because Lee didn't think about Washington, even though he was married into the Washington family. He never thought about Washington. It, it, didn't, it didn't matter to Lee. Of course, even though his father was <laughs> at one time Washington's right-hand man in some ways, you know, militarily. But uh, this, is, this is important. The two, putting the two together, you cannot see Lee without seeing Washington. And Washington was just as Southern as Robert E. Lee. He was, a, he was born and bred in Cavalier society, in Virginia society. That's what he was. And so when you, when you make Washington an honorary Yankee, you de- you, you tear him away from what he really was, which is the South. The Confederate States put Washington on their seal because they recognized in their mind what they were doing is fighting for the principles of Washington. In fact, there was a t- discussion about calling this the, uh, calling the South the Republic of Washington. This is what they saw themselves continuing, this tradition of Washington. And we can talk about whether Washington would have supported secession or not. 
He may have not have. He may have. He may have. I mean, who, who knows? Washington was very much a unionist and um, at the time, and of course, feared feared disunion because thought the union would would be the strongest thing to keep independence alive. But would he have a, would he have tolerated a government that just ran completely roughshod over the Constitution? You can say, well, he supported Hamilton, and Hamilton, you know, the Hamilton system was completely running roughshod over the system, over the Constitution. But um, as you move forward, would you have supported some of the innovations that were taking place over time? It's difficult to say. Uh, we know that uh, he had kinfolk, and so did Jefferson, that uh, eventually fought with the Confederacy. So it seems in that family, uh, they certainly um, were uh, pro-South. But we have to understand that. Washington is not a Yankee. Washington was a Southerner. And as soon as we can understand that position, the better we're going to be. And this is what we hope we can get out of this. You know, what is, what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition? We're not just a historical organization, as Dr. Livingston has said. We are exploring what is meaningful in the South. What is it about Washington that's meaningful? What is it about Lee that's meaningful? What is it that we can still learn from these men today in 2018? That's the key to understanding the Southern tradition. And that said, uh, the last piece is a book review by Boyd Cathy's entitled Souls of Lions, and it's actually a review of R.E. Mitchell's book, Souls of Lions, by the same. And it's about Confederates. It's a story of uh, two Confederate soldiers, and, and he says this book you know, brought him to tears at the end. Um, and he said it you know, captures really the spirit of what these men had to go through and that that profound sadness that profound sadness that these men had and he, he talks about it at the end he says at the very end of the novel 30 years later in 1895 at a reunion of those now aged heroes of the 50th on the battlefield of Bentonville quote a band played the Goldsboro Rifles paraded by the light of the campfires and the Confederates commenced to sing the old songs George listened for a while and then joined the singing. His voice cracked with emotion of sadness and joy, of sweet memories and bitter ones. He had known suffering but little joy, defeat and no victory, but through it all he had done his duty. And I think that's something that we have to understand about the memory of the South. The tears, the sadness. It was said that no one smiled in the South after the war. It was all they could do to think about loss. And that defeat, and these monuments that were constructed and erected to honor the people that died, this, this was what these things were there for. But also to say, you know, Lee was a great man. Every American should love Robert E. Lee. Every American should love Stonewall Jackson. They were honorable men. They did their duty. And by doing their duty, they were supporting an Americanism, a real Americanism. Not something that's treason not something that's fabricated, but a real Americanism. They were real Americans who could trace their lineage back to the founding generation, many of them. In fact, most of them. <laughs> My favorite uh, instance of that is when Richard Taylor discusses his family history with a German after the war and uh, tells the German after he goes through that his father had been president and his family had signed the declaration and that he hopes this German can instruct him on how, being, on how to be a good American. But that's it. And these people, uh, as, as uh, Sam Irvin said, you know, this defeat helped them shake the glory out. They were still looking for their glory. They were still looking for the thing that made them whole. And when we have a north over south perspective of history and culture and all the things, you know, whether, all the things that are tied into culture, religion, literature, music, whatever it is. We lose that identity. We lose that people in place. We can't have federalism unless we have a people in place. And so that is important. But national republicanism, the way we've made things vanilla, you take anything out that's pro-South, you can't have it that, that way because that's offensive or whatever the case may be. But this is the real problem with uh, this North over South vision and why it's important to push back against it as much as you can and why I think these pieces in this consistent theme and why that's important uh, and why we do so much of that. 
the Southern tradition still is viable. It still means something. And I've said on this podcast, the South still is America in many ways. Uh, I still think it is. The Southern tradition still is America. It never went away. Dr. Livingston said when the South was America, I can still say when the South is America. It's still there. That real America is still there, and that real vital part of the Southern tradition, not just what you get on uh, you know, the, the slapstick making fun of the South, but what the South really is still means something and still can help America moving forward. Until next time, good day. Good day.